You know what you're about to listen to? The Coolville Urbanism Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Koval Anderson. I've spent more than a decade thinking about the bicycle's role as transport in cities and working in over 100 cities to reestablish the bicycle on the urban landscape. Things have certainly changed since I started back in 2006, but as an impatient idealist, it's never going to be quick enough for my liking. I've always looked at this through a design optic, which I've learned is very different to the approach employed by your standard planners, engineers, and even bicycle advocates. I believe that design thinking is more fruitful than the conservative and often stagnant curriculum that those professions are taught. I published the book of my thoughts, philosophies, and work experience, Copenhagen Eyes, The Definitive Guide to Global Bicycle Urbanism, available wherever you buy your books. In this episode, I'll read aloud from the chapter about bicycle urbanism by design. I'll explain how designing a bicycle-friendly city with best-practice bicycle infrastructure is completely comparable to chair and even smartphone design. Throughout this chapter, and indeed my book, I insist that we start thinking about designing our life-sized streets and our cities, instead of relying on the visionless and destructive traffic engineering that we've had to put up with for decades. It's time to go back to the future. Let's get to it. Here's the baseline. We've been living together in cities for more than 7,000 years. By and large, we used those seven millennia to hammer out some serious best practices about cohabitation and transport in the urban theater, as well as the importance of social fabric. We threw most of that knowledge under the wheels of the automobile shortly after we invented it, and have subsequently suffered through a seculum horribilis, a horrible century in the urban context. Our over-enthusiasm for technology and our human tendency to suffer from short-term urban memory loss have further contributed to our zealous disregard for past experience. Cities thrill me, but it has always been the streets that fascinate me to no end. Streets are the skeletal structure of the city organism, the veins pumping the lifeblood of a city from one end of the urban landscape to the other. For 7,000 years, the streets of a city were the most democratic spaces in the history of Homo sapiens. Nothing beat the streets for democracy. We did everything in the streets. We transported ourselves, sure, but we also bought and sold our goods, flirted, gossiped, discussed politics. Our children played in the streets. They were an extension of our homes, of our living rooms. Urban development was natural and organic and was based on the immediate needs of the people living in the streets in particular and the city in general, both logistical needs and societal. Years ago, after I finished film school, I taught storytelling and screenwriting. After we, as Homo sapiens, have secured our three basic needs, water, food, and shelter, our fourth need emerges, and that is storytelling. For the better part of human history, we gathered around a fire pit after the day was done, telling stories, forming bonds, and further building belief systems and cultural mythologies. Now, some might argue that sex is our fourth basic need. But let's face it, telling or listening to stories is an important step towards having sex with someone. The fire pit was our meeting place, our anchor. As cities emerged and an indoor life became a part of our norm, The streets still remained as our urban fire pit in which we told our stories and formed our bonds. The automobile and the infrastructure required to move it through our cities sounded a death knell for the streets and for our urban fire pit. After 300,000 years of Homo sapiens and 7,000 years of democratic space, our perception of the streets changed drastically. The automobile industry made quick work of it as well. Basically, two things happened to change this perception. When the automobile appeared in our cities, it was an invasive species, detested by citizens. Motorists were despised. Makeshift monuments were erected in many American cities to the alarming number of victims of car crashes, in particular, children. There was an almost instant traffic safety problem, and everyone was at a loss as to how to solve it. Engineers were the urban heroes of the day in our rapidly expanding cities. Figuring out solutions for how to get electricity and water to our homes and sewage away from them. That couple of generations of engineers were brilliant, absolutely. 
but engineers were handed the task of solving this traffic safety carnage. The best problem solvers of the day were an obvious choice for tackling such a serious problem. What happened, however, was that the streets went from being regarded as a subconscious democratic fire pit to becoming treated as public utilities. Not at all human spaces, but puzzles to be solved with mathematical equations. The automobile industry also had a problem. It had shiny new products to sell, and yet everyone hated them. They knew they needed to change the public perception of streets, and so they employed marketing, spin, and good old-fashioned ridicule to start the ball rolling. This is where they cut their teeth on marketing their vehicles and carved out techniques still in use today. It was one thing that engineers were tweaking the way traffic lights functioned in order to accommodate the rising number of cars, but the automobile industry saw an opportunity to start selling the idea that street space should be allocated almost exclusively to those cars. The idea was simple. Everyone else, get the hell out of the way. It started with op-eds and ads in local newspapers from automobile associations about pedestrians staying out of the streets and instead using the growing number of crosswalks. In some cities in America, Boy Scouts were enlisted to hand out flyers, chastising pedestrians for their behavior. The timeless act of crossing the street in the middle of the block was gradually becoming socially unacceptable. Anyone who resisted this new school of thought was labeled as old-fashioned, standing in the way of progress. That very American word, jaywalking, was intended simply to ridicule pedestrians who were slow to adapt to the desires of the automobile industry. The word jay was a derogatory word for a country bumpkin, someone who didn't know the ways of the big cool city. Now, if we live in cities, the last thing we want is to be considered outsiders. We want to feel a sense of collective belonging. One simple word, repeated ad nauseum, was all that was needed. The last great obstacle faced by those wanting to secure street space for cars was the angry mothers of America, who kept seeing their children killed or maimed by cars in the streets outside their homes. Enter the playground. That little zoological garden into which we continue to put our kids was an invention of the automobile industry as a way to get those little rascals out of the way and to appease their mothers and their families. And finally, the stage was set. The coast was clear of those irritating, squishy obstacles called humans, and the greatest paradigm shift in the history of our cities was complete. It took under two decades to reverse 7,000 years of perceiving streets as democratic spaces, and we're still suffering from this to this day. Peter Norton's book, Fighting Traffic, is your go-to tome about this fascinating and depressing period in transportation history. What also happened was that our societal fire pit was effectively removed, doused in water, buried out of sight, and paved over with asphalt. Fire pits have re-emerged in some cities. Pedestrian-friendly streets, public transport, and the bicycle have brought back the opportunity to gather with our urban flock. Whether we speak to each other or not, we are elbow to elbow with our fellow citizens, sharing a subconscious urban experience. In the Copenhagen rush hour, on every street, small fire pits are formed at every intersection, allowing citizens to gather in clusters while transporting themselves through the city. The urban anthropological advantages of having impromptu cycling fire pits should not be underestimated. Motorists walk out of a house and into a garage and get into a car for a drive to work. They park and they enter an office. There is little interaction with other citizens in such a vacuum-packed life. Cycling through a city, however, you are closely connected with the urban landscape, using all of your senses. Every morning as I pass the City Hall Square in Copenhagen, I see cyclists checking out the clock tower. They either slow down or speed up, depending on their schedule. I don't communicate directly with other people at red lights, but we are connected. I see human forms. I hear coughs or telephone conversations. I smell shampoo and perfume around me. I get ideas for shopping when I see clothes or shoes worn by someone else. Many of us exchange flirtatious glances or smiles, especially in the Nordic Spring. I'll probably do the same as a pedestrian or aboard public transport, but there is an amazing dynamic on the cycle tracks and at red lights, jostling for space, keeping our balance, soaking up sensory impressions before moving on to the next fire pit. The Danish novelist Johannes V. Jensen, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1944, has many references to urban cycling in his body of work. In his 1936 novel, Gudrun, he writes this, and, like a large home, Copenhagen begins the day's work. Already down on the streets, one is at home, with loose hair, 
in long sitting rooms through which one travels sociably on a bicycle. In offices, workshops, and boutiques, you are at home. In your own home, part of one large family that has divided the entire city amongst itself and that runs it in an orderly fashion, like a large house, so that everyone has a role and everyone gets what they need. Copenhagen is like a large, simple house. Indeed it is. A home with a much-needed hearth. And, lest we forget, this was the norm in most cities on the planet for decades. From the bicycle boom in the late 19th century to at least the 1940s and 1950s, the bicycle was a normal form of transport from Manchester to Singapore, from Sydney to Seville. The modal share for bicycles in Los Angeles a century ago was 20%. Small transportational fire pits around which cyclists, or rather just citizens on bikes, gathered, were warming our cities. The fledgling vocation of traffic engineering, granted carte blanche by the new paradigm, continued the radical engineering of our streets. Standards were developed in America through the 1930s and 1940s, in tandem with the rising belief that cars were the vehicle of a glorious future. The standards started to travel, and were readily adopted by countries around the world. This development accelerated through the 1950s and 1960s. Cycling traffic in most cities in the world peaked in the late 1940s and then began a sharp decline, even in Copenhagen and Amsterdam. 55% of Copenhageners rode a bike in 1949. By 1969, just 20 years, that number had fallen to around 20% as roads were widened to accommodate cars and cycle tracks were removed. The most Surprising thing about traffic engineering is that it is largely unchanged in the decades since the 1950s. In our modern society, we would be absolutely outraged if one vital profession lagged behind. Imagine if medical care were still using the same techniques and science as it did in the 1950s, or education, or parenting. That would be so bizarre and unacceptable. And yet, we accept that traffic engineering has failed to modernize, or perhaps just failed. When you start to scratch just a little below the surface, you discover that we live in cities that are controlled by strange and often outdated mathematical theories, models, and engineering solutions that continue to be used despite the fact that they are of little use to modern cities. One of them is called the 85th percentile. It's a method that cities all over the planet use to determine speed limits. It's the standard. Nobody questions it. Certainly not the engineers and planners who, for decades, have swallowed it whole during their studies. Which reminds me of the old traffic engineer joke. Why did the engineer cross the road? Because that's what we did last year. The concept of the 85th percentile is rather simple. The speed limit of a road is set by determining the speed of 85% of the cars that go down it. In other words, the speed limit is solely set by the speed of drivers. And this is the basic rule that determines traffic speeds worldwide including, more often than not, the street right outside your home. It can, of course, be revised, but that rarely happens. The engineers will just shrug and say that the 85th percentile method is the only method and it can't be changed. The numbers don't lie. The problem is that human beings are not numbers. Here's the tricky part about the 85th percentile method. It assumes the following. The large majority of drivers are reasonable and prudent, do not want to have a crash, and desire to reach their destination in the shortest possible time. A speed at or below which 85% of people drive at any given location under good weather and visibility conditions may be considered as the maximum safe speed for that location. If they're assuming that the large majority of drivers are reasonable and prudent, then what about the rest of the drivers? Do we just assume that everything is going to be fine by handing over complete power of our streets to motorists? Not to mention mixing anthropological assumptions with pseudoscience? Eh, I'm not convinced. All of this seems suspiciously like an argument to build more highways and freeways, because with more speed comes more security, as those traffic engineers once said. A few years ago, I decided to figure out where this 85th percentile came from. What was the origin story? When we finally figured it out at my office, we all guessed how old it was. There were guesses between 15 and 30 years old. But none of us were close. In reality, it is based on a 1964 study by a man named David Solomon entitled Accidents on Main Rural Highways Related to Speed, Driver, and Vehicle. Yeah, you heard that right. Main Rural Highways, not city streets. 
It is still wholly endorsed by the U.S. Department of Commerce and the Bureau of Public Roads, which was administered at the time of the study by another man named Rex Witten. He was also, surprise, surprise, a federal highway administrator. It's okay if you're not actually surprised. In essence, what I'm saying is that a study from 1964 remains the main argument to build more highways and freeways with faster speeds where the ends justify the means, even if the means ignore vulnerable groups such as pedestrians and cyclists and assume that public transport simply doesn't exist. Even if the study is now also used to serve the automobile in densely populated urban areas far from any freeways. The Institute of Traffic Engineers once wrote that the 85th percentile is how drivers vote with their feet. The ITE, however, failed to mention that when it comes to establishing speed limits in cities, pedestrians and cyclists are excluded from their election. They don't even get the chance to go to the polls. And all of this is happening right now as you read this in your city with your tax money. I could go on. It's no secret that I'm critical of traffic engineering and the pedestal on which we place it as the sole solution for planning traffic in cities. I speak to this in the keynotes I give around the world. I'm often approached by audience members who want to discuss things further after I come off stage. It's interesting. In six different countries, I've met six different traffic engineers who came up to me after a keynote and said exactly the same thing, which I find fascinating. I'm a traffic engineer, Michael, but I'm a problem solver. Nobody has told me that there was a different problem to solve. The same line, almost verbatim, spoken in English in six different accents by traffic engineers frustrated by the fact that other solvable problems exist, and they were kept in the dark about it. Like discovering there was ice cream in the freezer for ages, but you were told there wasn't. In my book, I cover how we desperately need to change the questions we've been asking in cities for close to a century. First, though, I want to offer up some alternative philosophies. We can rightly assume that there was engineering in play over the past 7,000 years that preceded the automobile in our cities. Roads and squares were built and buildings to go alongside them. The Romans, among others, excelled at construction and developing techniques. By and large, it was a much more organic process. Engineering responded to the immediate needs of the people who were living there and worked in tandem with them. Necessity was the mother of invention, as it should be, although no longer, it would seem. We live in an overly tech-horny world where we invent things because we can, not because we actually need them. No one, for example, has been able to explain to me what the phrase smart cities is supposed to mean, and I speak at smart city conferences all over the world. Believe me, I have asked a great many people. It's a fancy, seductive catchphrase, but one without any specific definition. In order to plan for our urban future, we need to look closely at our urban past. A few years ago, I was watching Back to the Future with my son, who was nine at the time. The film ended, and he asked me what year it was made in. I told him it was 1985. He thought for a moment, and then he laughed. So, wait, Doc went 30 years into the future? That's like, that's like now. But there's no flying cars or goofy clothes. No, there isn't. He nailed it a century of technological and fashion promises that failed to deliver, a seculum horribilis from which we need to recover. Feel free to lump autonomous cars and the hype surrounding them into the same category. When I speak of the importance of going back to the future, I mean to a place where we were rational and realistic, back to a time or times where we did things that made sense. Bicycle urbanism by design is the way forward. We are surrounded if not bombarded by products to buy in our daily lives. Take a look around you at the many products that you've acquired. Your smartphone, toothbrush, remote control, mouse, chair. They all have one thing in common. There was a designer or a design team dedicated to ensuring that you would have a positive design experience when using it. The team that produced my smartphone was employed by a multinational corporation that is intent on increasing profit margins and outcompeting their competitors. Sure, but the designers? The designers bent over backwards to make sure that the phone was easy, intuitive, and enjoyable to use by me, my 11-year-old daughter, or my 88-year-old dad, and everybody in between. It was a human-to-human -human process, from idea to purchase. Their sole task was thinking about the human on the other end of that process. That can't be said of traffic engineering, or even traffic planning in most parts of the world, where mathematical models focused on moving cars around is the primary focus. It's a simple question. What if we designed our streets like we designed 
everything else in our lives, like we expect everything else to be designed. It's no secret that Denmark is a design culture. The phrase Danish design is swathed loftily in quotation marks. And my kids even have design classes in the third and fourth grades here in Copenhagen. The three principles of Danish design are carved in stone, practical, functional, elegant. Humans love chairs and have constantly been designing them for several millennia, as well as interpreting them. Designers and architects have been trying to funk up the chair since forever. All manner of interpretations have seen the light of day, from the interesting to the wacky. We can regard chairs at exhibitions that have been dressed up like an octopus or a shopping cart and either love them or hate them. It doesn't matter. The point is that none of us have four crazy interpretations of the chair in our living rooms for our guests to sit on. All people want is a chair. You're probably sitting down as you listen to this. Think about the chair or sofa that you're on. You walked over to it. You turned. You sat down. You didn't have to circle the chair, pensively scratching your chin, wondering what the designer's intentions were. It wasn't necessary to search for an on-off button. You weren't concerned at any point that your chair was going to disappear from under you in the middle of this podcast. You sat down. It was easy and intuitive. You have a lot of experience with it. You've been doing it for a while. Now imagine if cycling or walking in a city were as easy and intuitive as that simple action. Well, a well-designed bicycle infrastructure network is exactly like a well-designed chair. It is practical and functional. It requires little interpretation to use it. If it's also elegant, then so much the better. And mark my words, this is not a pipe dream. This is not some wacky theory. It's a reality, and it's attainable. In their study entitled Understanding the Seductive Experience, designers Julie Kozlowski and Nathan Shredroff explore the seductive nature of design. To paraphrase, the seductive power of design can transcend issues of price and performance. They have the ability to create an emotional bond with their audiences, almost a need for them. Hmm, that makes me think. Do I swoon every time I cycle around Copenhagen on best practice infrastructure that is kept swept and smooth? No. Nor do I fall to my knees in awe of the beauty of the Seven Chair by Danish architect Arne Jakobsen in my living room, or sigh wistfully every time I pull out my Samsung Galaxy S9 smartphone. All have seduced me, however. The thrill of the seduction bubbled to the surface in the early stages of my emotional relationship with such objects. But now, it has been absorbed into my subconscious. I don't doubt that I experience pleasure when using such objects. But damn, <laughs> I need them. I need that constant sense of well-being I experience when using them. I don't need to think about them. They just need to work, and they need to look spectacular. In the case of bicycle infrastructure, I need to be safe, and I need to feel safe and get to where I'm going without having to put too much thought into it, just like any other kind of good design. The seduction of design became apparent to me while playing a car racing game on our Xbox with my son Felix when he was about 10 years old. It's a game where you get to select which car you want to race with, and then you can choose cars from all the major brands and throughout the history of the automobile. As Felix was scrolling through the selection, I noticed how every now and then he would stop and say, Oh, daddy, cool car. Oh yeah, daddy, cool car. Now listen, my kids, I've calculated, spend no more than five hours a year in a car in our daily lives in Copenhagen. We may rent a car in the summer holidays, but the rest of the year, cars simply don't register on their radar. Or mine. We just have no cause to talk about cars since we never use them. So it was all the more interesting to see Felix look at vintage cars and react to them positively. As he scrolled, I started to keep track of which cars he was reacting to, screen grabbing them, writing them down, and then looking them up. Every single car was pre-1972, whether it was a Volvo, BMW, Ford, you name it. Back when car design was cool, and not the generic blur of anonymous colorless vehicles we see today. This kid saw cool design and knew it was cool without having any investment in the subject. Now don't worry, I also have a bike-related anecdote about the young Felix, although it's reversed. Where cars don't figure into our conversation, bikes most certainly do simply because they are our primary transport form. In a city where 62% of the population ride a bike to work or school, bikes are a key element in our transport habits. But they are also incredibly anonymous. I noticed that Felix, as he graduated from bike to bike, since learning to cycle at four years old, would invariably choose bikes that looked like everyone else's, particularly his schoolmates' bikes. Among children, the desire to conform is strong. Until one day, when he sent me a photo taken at one of the bike racks outside his school, accompanied by the text, Daddy must have 
It was a photo of a vintage Schwinn chopper, complete with banana seat and backrest. This learn-to-cycle-in-the-1970s dad was thrilled, but it was also odd that he was reacting to a bike design so far outside the typological norms of his contemporaries. It's just really cool, was Felix's response when I asked. So I embarked on a mission to accommodate his request, ending up finding him a rally chopper to ride. Apart from enjoying his new ride, he started to experience something unusual in the Copenhagen context. People noticed his bike. In a forest, it's hard to appreciate one particular tree, which is the case with bikes in Copenhagen. It's hard to impress Copenhageners with your bike. But Felix would roll up to a red light and grown men would look down at his bike, nod approvingly, and say, Cool bike, kid. Small kids would point at him cycling past and exclaim to anybody who was listening, Wow, cool bike. After cycling anonymously for years, Felix was discovering how his personal design choice was received positively among strangers. He was seduced by design rather than performance. Because, let's face it, choppers are incredibly uncomfortable to ride. The citizens of Copenhagen have been seduced by the bicycle infrastructure network. It is practical and functional, getting them where they want to go quickly and conveniently. There is elegance in the smooth, structured uniformity and high level of maintenance. The smoothest asphalt in Denmark is always found on the cycle tracks. Even when the weather is miserable, which is more often than not in Copenhagen, the seduction continues. 75% of Copenhageners cycle all winter. There are better days for cycling in the city, but despite the challenges, it's still the quickest way to get around. The city knows how to make cycling a feasible option throughout the year. In the winter, the official policy is that all cycle tracks are cleared of snow by 8 a.m. The goal is black asphalt by the time the citizens head out to work or school. As in many cities, the streets are divided up into categories for snow clearance. It's just that the bicycle infrastructure sits right at the top of the list. If a snowstorm is more intense, it may prove difficult to keep the infrastructure clear of snow. The citizens know that it's temporary, however, and that the city is on its way and doing its best. The journey home will be much more pleasant, despite the sub-zero temperatures. When you invest in a designer chair, table, or lamp, you take care of it. Why should it be any different with a comprehensive network of bicycle infrastructure? Keep it clean, polished, beautiful, cherish it. Design is seductive, and design also possesses great power, the power to change human behavior, no less. Wherever you are, as you listen to this, you've probably heard the same kind of comments about cyclists. You might even have uttered them yourself. Oh, those damn cyclists. Breaking the law. Insert whatever local swear words might be relevant. Now, the first thing I say when I hear this, and man, I hear it all over the planet, is that it is completely unacceptable to scold cyclists when the city hasn't given them best practice infrastructure, or even worse, none at all. I can't scold my children for stealing cookies if we don't even have a cookie jar. Homo sapiens react to design, either positively or negatively, with their behavior. If you don't like their behavior, it's important to take a long, hard look at the cause before going ballistic. Homo sapiens, by nature, do not like to break laws or partake in socially unacceptable behavior. We are a largely conservative species of herd animals. I don't look around for rocks to throw every time I pass a window on the street, nor do you. I just want to go about my daily life, enjoyably and efficiently, without spending too much time contemplating the hows and the whys. I cycle on a network designed for me and others like me, one that limits my need to deviate from the legal norms. Indeed, Copenhageners are the world's best-behaved cyclists due to the uniformity and intuitive design of the bicycle infrastructure. I know this for a fact. I have data to back it up. After studying over 80,000 cyclists in Copenhagen at various intersections, with my desire line analysis study that I developed in 2012, I can conclude that only 5% of cyclists smash through the Danish traffic laws. 5%. Through design, we have positively influenced human behavior. A cluster of cyclists at a red light in Copenhagen is a study in fidgeting, phone checking, city glancing, or straightforward staring, not much else. Beautifully dull. Even when stopped by a red light, we know that we'll get to where we're going on time and more quickly than we would when using other transport forms. If you want to tackle the issue of cyclist behavior, first build a network that keeps them safe and separated from the other traffic users. Create a unique space for cycling, a luxury that has long been afforded to motorists and pedestrians. Prioritize cyclists at intersections. And then, 
And only then do you have the right to criticize them. Although by that point, you'll only be criticizing a small group of bad apples. And you'll prefer to regard the view of the ripe orchard. Well-designed infrastructure levels the playing field. Those who use it take care of it and defend it. It's asphalt democracy. By using basic design principles for the human users of the bicycle and the urban space, instead of flawed mathematical models employed by traffic engineering, we will accelerate the journey towards a bicycle-friendly urban future. That wraps up another episode of the Coolville Urbanism Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Koval Anderson. Thanks for listening. And you know, remember, it's your city. Take it back. <laughs>